Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think if we may, uh, we'll start uh, and go straight into the fire of litigation uh, with Tim Lord, who's going to talk to us about disclosure issues. Thank you very much, Sir Christopher, uh, and thank you all uh, for coming today. Um, it looked like it was going to be a rather uneven struggle between tea and cake and my disclosure talk five minutes ago, but it looks as though uh, troops have rallied, so thanks for, for all coming along. Um, I'm going to talk first about the guiding principles behind disclosure, which you'll all know about. Um, it, it's obviously very important to bear in mind the purpose of disclosure, which is to uh, bring forward documentary material to prove your case or to undermine the other side's case. It, the, the, there's, a very, there's a very interesting uh, and useful um, judicial consideration of memory by Miss Justice Leggett uh, in the Guessman and Credit Suisse case, which I've um, put on that bullet, to, to the effect that there is no such thing as a sort of photographic or direct recollection that when the, when the brain um, pulls things back from the past, it's endlessly calibrating and recalibrating the material so that, it, in fact, even events that you think you saw or heard very clearly have been filtered through a prism of all sorts of other factors. Uh, and he, he says, as, as so many judges obviously have said before, that it's the documents that really provide the reliable forensic trail. Typically, in fraud cases, uh, there will be a, an asymmetry of information, so the uh, alleged uh, victim will not really know what's gone on, and the alleged fraudster will obviously know what uh, happened on, on their side of the fence. That makes it very important, if you're acting for a claimant, that you set up your case carefully, and that you remember that, that most fraud cases are certainly, um, certainly are sustained for much of their life, sometimes even through trial, on the basis of inference. In other words, the uh, claimant is not going to know exactly what happened, but uh, can plead fraud by various uh, proper deductions from facts that the claimant does in fact know. Uh, I made a reference there to the Keckman case, because in that case, Mr Justice Flo, as he then was, uh, goes through some of the relevant case law on the question of inference in a fraud or dishonesty case, and in his view explains that that case law doesn't require that the only proper inference is one of fraud or dishonesty, only that it be the more likely um, explanation as opposed to negligence or, or an innocent uh, explanation. It's important to think very carefully about what documents should be disclosed and what you should be giving uh, by way of disclosure and asking for uh, if you're the receiving party. Uh, and I put there, be careful what you wish for, because it's very easy, I think, to get into a, into a mindset of thinking that you want lots of material or you should be disclosing lots of material, whereas in fact I think that the, the, the key task is to work out exactly what it is that you need or should be asking for to make good the forensic case that you think um, is, is your client's case. So it's really quality, not quantity, uh, and less is more, uh, uh, as is often said about my submissions. Um, if we go to the next slide, the importance of the first CMC. Uh, the, the first CMC, in, in my view, is really the crucial stage in the disclosure battle. And uh, in, in fraud cases particularly, those cases can be won or lost at that uh, first engagement. It obviously sets up the battleground for disclosure. The, the, the CPR has some very helpful provisions, helpful for claimants really, uh, the alleged victims of fraud, allowing them really to, to dig and delve and probe a bit to see what material they ought to be getting from the defendant. And I've identified there the, the, the provisions of the CPR that I'm sure are well known to you all, um, including the disclosure schedule and the EDQ, and the pre-CMC meetings and discussions that are, uh, the parties are enjoined to, to have in order to try to um, agree as much of the disclosure uh, ambit as, as possible. Then, uh, looking at disclosure from the perspective of advising the claimant, the claimant will obviously usually be the alleged victim of the fraud uh, and will be handicapped by lack of information. As I said, the first CMC is the, is, can often be the, the one and only chance before the trial to, to probe and to try to really fish around and interrogate the defendant to try to see what sort of material may, la may lay on the other side um, of the fence. It's important not to blow that opportunity. I always think that, that, that um, 
good fraud lawyers have something of the bloodhound about them, which doesn't mean that they've got um, big floppy ears and a, and a wet nose, which can be often off-putting for clients and, and judges. But they, but they do have a, a keen, a keen a forensic sense and are looking all the time to see, to see where the forensic trail may be leading. Built, running into the first CMC, if you're acting for the claimant, it's absolutely critical that you switch that facility on and that you scrutinise very carefully the defendant's pleading to see what they do or don't say in response to what will usually be an inference case of fraud that they're facing and to see where, where it is that they try and slide off answering the point or try and send you forward and backwards in their pleading and you, you end up not being able to find out the actual answer in there. And all the usual games that are played by unscrupulous defendants in order to try to put you off the scent. It's important to remember that under the CPR, the defendants don't have a, the, the alleged um, fraudster doesn't have a, a, a right to put the claimant to proof, as would be the case in a criminal case, and I've cited the uh, helpful decision of Mr Justice Roth in the National Grid case in that regard, uh, and it, it can often be worth as a claimant putting in a Part 18 request into the mix to increase the forensic pressure on the defendant to, to allow um, more effective submissions to be made at the CMC to support applications for further disclosure where the defendants are resisting it. The second, this is a second slide on advising the claimant. Usual, usual warnings here. Um, look out for the Dickensian novel masquerading as the defendant's disclosure schedule. You will often get a great tome from a defendant saying how many millions of man-hours and gazillions of pounds it's spent and how many places it's looked at, usually everywhere except the obvious place marked fraud documents in the, in the desk, in the, in the partner's desk. So you, you, want to be, you want to be very alert to that. It's almost a rule that the longer the disclosure statement from a, from a defendant, uh, the more likely it is that there's some bodies buried somewhere. Obviously, be, 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 be wary of a sort of blizzard approach. If you're, if you're the claimant and you want disclosure, you want to guard against the defendants who try and inundate you with so much material that you can't really manage it, you can't process it, you can't, you can't really see your way through it, and that's a well-known defendant tactic. Obviously, you've got to be alert to making sure that you've um, requested searches be done on all the appropriate sources, archives, custodians, and so on, and again, be vigilant to look out for names that are left off, date limits, um, guillotines coming in for no apparent reason, defendants stopping running on a search, um, to a later period, uh, and so on. Uh, final point advising the claimants. Um, consider going for a staged approach, which Ms. Justice Gloucester, as she then was, um, suggested might be appropriate in the Berezovsky case in relation to train of inquiry documents. So if you're a claimant, you may find quite considerable resistance early on from the judge and the other side to a, to a, a very wide-ranging disclosure exercise. If that's the case, then you want to think about building, um, building your, your disclosure case incrementally and taking, um, taking what you can get at the first stage but reserving your right to come back if, in fact, the first wave of disclosure suggests that more documents ought to be looked for or produced. It's important, I think, to lay down a marker at that first CMC if you're for the claimant about where disclosure might tend to make sure that you're not, you're not foreclosing yourself from coming back for more documents if, in fact, you haven't quite captured the right searches or if, in fact, more turns up down the, the, the line. But it, it's also worth putting a marker down, uh, in, in my experience, about, about the fact that the uh, search process and the um, electronic search terms and so on are only really designed to manage the process of producing relevant material. And if a party knows that there is relevant material, if a defendant knows, for example, that there is adverse material known in a certain archive, the, the fact that the various search terms are sculpted in a particular way doesn't exonerate or absolve that defendant from giving disclosure. And that's a point, I think, that should be more emphasised in the rules and by the judiciary. Advising the defendant very quickly, um, as Sir Christopher used uh, tongue-in-cheek to tell me to advise m all my clients, if in doubt, tell the truth. <laughs> in other words, d d do the right thing. It's obviously easier said than done. There are, there are, there are different uh, grades of alleged fraudster. If you're acting for a, a hardened fraudster, then it'll be very difficult to get them to do what they should do. You've obviously got to do the best you can in that regard. But I'm looking really more at the cases that are in the middle, really, where it's not, 
entirely clear whether there's been a fraud. The fraud might be through partial statement, uh, half-truths. It, it's all a bit unclear in a big organisation. It's not always clear whether or not there was a fraud. Sometimes the fraud lies within one or two little cells within an organisation. And, and e even, even the, the party itself, the alleged fraudster, doesn't know for sure what, what went on. In my, in my experience, it's much better to, to do a proper exercise if the client will allow you to, to do it for them in order to flush out any, any um, skeletons in the cupboard and to make sure that you can justify the exercise you've done. You can say to the judge with, with a clear conscience that you've looked properly and hard. It puts the claimant under real pressure to identify the smoking gun, to um, uh, nail its colours to the mast in terms of, of the post-disclosure fraud case that they're going to run, which has it, it, its own um, advantage for a defendant in terms of, of limiting the freedom of manoeuvre for, for the claimant at the trial. It, it also has, has the advantage that if, in fact, there was a fraud there and there are smoking guns, there are transcripts or there are little emails that give the game away, you're more likely to flush those out sooner rather than later and take the appropriate uh, um, action. And then finally, uh, I think that's it. That's it. So there wasn't a final. That was a, that was a very, 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 very f good finale. Am, am, I, am I on time? <laughs> Thank you very much. You. Now, uh, we pass from those uh, preliminaries to freezing orders and enforcement against the assets of third parties, which Paul Wright is going to talk to us about. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the, the situation that I'm considering today is where one has a fraud claim or, or judgment against a defendant who has few or no assets in his own name. Uh, the assets are held by companies which uh, he controls or a discretionary trust or trusts which the defendant is the set law of uh, and one, but only one, of the named uh, beneficiaries. Now, in, in such a situation, uh, prima facie, the uh, assets are not those of the defendant. Assets, even of a one-man company, belong to the company. Similarly, a beneficiary of, of a discretionary trust has no vested rights in assets. He, he is merely the possible recipient of a, a distribution. Now, in addressing this situation, uh, I, I'm going to concentrate on very briefly, freezing orders and substantive issues. Uh, I'm not going to address questions of, of jurisdiction or proper or governing law. As a broad introduction, I think it's, it's fair to say that the attitude of, of the English courts is a willingness to help claimants, uh, particularly in the context of freezing orders. When it comes to questions of enforcing against assets which are nominally held by third parties. The court may be a little bit more circumspect there in uh, allowing the claimant to, to enforce its uh, claim or, or judgment. But I think the, the quotations from Lord Justice Lewison in one of the Pugachev cases, which I've uh, put on the slide, are, are indicative of the general approach of, of the courts. Uh, in particular, the first one, where Lord Justice Lewison said that it would be a matter of concern if uh, a defendant can make himself judgment-proof merely by setting up discretionary trusts. <coughs> the question of freezing injun injunctions against defendants, the, uh, the, the standard form, commercial court standard form at the moment, includes uh, in its definition of assets, assets which are not beneficially owned by the defendant, but over which he has control, which should uh, cover, as against that particular defendant, uh, assets held by companies over which uh, the defendant exercises control. The standard order also includes <coughs> interests held by the defendant under discretionary trusts. So, in relation to both the discretionary trusts and companies, the claimant should be able to freeze in an appropriate case uh, the assets in it should be able to stop the defendant from dealing with the assets. But, of course, uh, that does not give the uh, claimant full protection in, many ca in most cases where one's uh, got a claim against a fraudster. 
uh, particularly in cases where the third party uh, holds assets abroad, which are not going to be caught uh, by the uh, freezing injunction as against that third party. So in those circumstances, what does the uh, claimant do? Um, the, the Pugachev case, I think, is instructive, it, it, an instructive example of, of what a claimant can do in such situation. In that case, uh, Mr. Pugachev uh, gave, uh, very, uh, get, gave disclosure of his interests under New Zealand trusts. Apparently, uh, discretionary trusts are, are, are very popular in New Zealand. Um, and uh, the claimant got an order from the court that he provide full details of, of those trusts, including uh, the, the identity of the trustees. On the back of that, the claimant uh, got an order against the trustees, uh, freezing the assets in their hands, uh, and the Court of Appeal in, in that case said that all the uh, claimant need establish is a good arguable case that the assets are in reality the assets of, of the defendant. They're under his, his control, and that would be enough to uh, free, freeze the assets pending a resolution of whether the uh, claimant could actually enforce any judgment it may get against the defendant. So that very briefly is the uh, position in relation to freezing injunctions. Now, obviously, it's all very well freezing assets, but the most important question for any claimant would be trying to actually enforce against those assets themselves. Now, the first, obviously, first port of call would be to see whether there are any direct claims against the third party. In many fraud cases, uh, it's possible uh, to, uh, where assets have been stolen, it's possible to trace assets into the hands of third parties, and, and often fraudsters uh, put the stolen funds into discretionary trusts that they have set up. Uh, it may also be possible uh, to unwind dispositions that have been made, even if they're not proprietary funds, or on the basis of, for example, Section 423 of the Insolvency Act. However, if there are no substantive causes of action against the uh, third party, it would, the claimant is going to have to establish that the assets are beneficially uh, owned by the defendant uh, rather than the third party. Now, dealing first with the question of, of, of companies, uh, the, the, the question of piercing the corporate veil uh, what was addressed by the Supreme Court in, in Prest and Prest, which was a, a divorce case, but nonetheless the principles are, are equally applicable to the situation that, that I'm considering today. Uh, and in his, in his judgment in Prest and Prest, Lord, Lord Sumption identified two, two principles, the concealment principle uh, and the evasion principle. Now, so far as the concealment principle is concerned, he, he said that uh, the individual can be regarded as the true beneficial owner uh, in circumstances where he buys the assets with his money uh, in B's name. Now, in those circumstances, there's a presumption that uh, the defendant was to retain beneficial ownership of, of the asset. Now, it has to be stressed that that's only a presumption, uh, and it can be rebutted if the uh, defendant can show that the intention was... Uh, different. Now, in that case, the, the defendant could not, primarily because he, wa he, he wasn't cooperating in the divorce proceedings and didn't put any satisfactory evidence in, in, in relation to the uh, circumstances in which the properties there were purchased. Now, uh, the, the Lord Sumption's analysis impressed has, has been uh, adopted and applied by, by the commercial case, court in, in two cases. Uh, in which de dealing with fraud, fraud claims. And in, in both cases, uh, the, the judges held that, made strong inferences against the defendant uh, and inferred that uh, he must have provided, paid himself or provided the funds for the purchase of, purchase of the assets. Uh, and therefore, they were prepared to presume that the assets were held on resulting trust uh, for, for him. Moving to the second principle, um, which was identified by Lord Sumption and Preston, Preston, the evasion principle. 
th this is um, what Law Sumption said was, was truly piercing the corporate veil. And this is where you have the, the individual interposes a company to defeat uh, existing rights against uh, the, the claimant. Now, again, that, that principle was applied in the Solidenko case as an alternative to an application of the concealment principle. That was applied, uh, as one can see from the extract I've set out on the slide, to a situation I in which money was paid out, paid to the company in order to avoid uh, the claims of creditors. It was a Section 423-like situation. So very briefly, that's, that's the position in relation to companies. So far as discretionary trusts are concerned, the, the, first, the first question that one might consider is extreme cases where the set law has had has powers under the trust deed so wide that they can be said to be tantamount to ownership. A quite a good example of this is the Privy Council decision in, in Tassaroof where the, uh, the uh, set law had the power to revoke in any circumstances he wished. And in those circumstances, the, the Privy Council said that this was, uh, this power was tantamount to ownership uh, and it would therefore be so appropriate to appoint a receiver uh, and for distributions to be made to the settlor's creditors. How, however, if th this is the case is not one in which there are, there are uh, wide powers reserved to the settlor under the trust deed, the, the usual um, argument that the claimant will seek to deploy in order to try and get at the trust assets is to say uh, that the trust was a sham. The effect of that argument would be that the trust is void uh, and that the assets remain beneficially owned by the settlor. Uh, however, I think it's fair to say uh, that the um, argument historically hasn't succeeded very often. Uh, and the reason why that is so is because uh, on the preponderance of authority, it, it's necessary uh, to show that both the settlor and the trustee intended that the trust deed was to give a false impression. And they had no real subjective intention to create a trust. Now, obviously, in relation to a fraudster, the court may well be prepared to make that inference that that, that was his intention. He was intended just to keep the assets for his own benefit and that the trust was a, a mere facade. However, in relation to uh, professional trustees, the court is much more uh, reluctant to um, draw such an inference. And in fact, the, the, the Canadian authorities uh, and some academic, uh, some academic uh, commentators have suggested that the, 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 the requirement for both the settlor and the trustee to have this shamming intention is um, too strict, and it should really only be the settlor's intention that is relevant. If he doesn't intend to create a proper trust, then no proper trust should be created. But as I've said, that doesn't really represent English law at the moment, uh, and it would probably require a decision of at least the Court of Appeal uh, or, on that question um, to, to determine whether the, uh, a shamming intention by the set law is sufficient. Now, so far as establishing a, a sham is concerned, following the wishes of the set law is probably not in itself sufficient. And it, it may be... Uh, something from which the court can draw inferences in an extreme case where one can say that the trustee has truly exercised no proper discretion, particularly if the, uh, any, any distributions as a result of uh, a request from the set law are ones which the, the trustee wasn't entitled to make. The last point to make about sham is that uh, an initially valid trust cannot become a sham uh, unless all the parties agree. And by all the parties, one means that once a tr trust has been set up, that all the, all, the potential, all the class of beneficiaries have to agree to that. So it's very unlikely that that is going to be, a situ that that is going to be the position. Normally with these trusts, they are, uh, the, the class of beneficiaries includes the family of the uh, uh, defendant, and they are unlikely to agree to such a course. The, 
There is uh, a suggestion in some of the authorities, however, that informal control over the assets should be enough to allow uh, a, a defendant, sorry, a, a claimant, to enforce uh, its judgment. In principle, on the authorities, uh, such as ANA and esteem settlement, that shouldn't be enough to defeat the rights of other beneficiaries. If, as I've said before, if a, if a proper trust is set up, the fact, the fact that a trustee allows um, himself to be dominated by the set law uh, should not result in the trust being in, invalid. It simply results, means that the trustee has been in breach of trust. But there are suggestions uh, from in, in the judgment of Lord Justice Lewis and in Pugachev, uh, and also the uh, decision of Christopher Butcher QC in Shurgikin, that uh, de facto control may be enough. Now, it, I think that that's probably not the correct position under, under the authorities, but uh, it may be that uh, it's something that could attract a court in an appropriate case. Lastly, um, as I've, I've mentioned Pugachev quite a few times, it's quite an important case in this area of law, and there was, in fact, a trial of the claims uh, to get at the assets in, in July and August uh, of this year, uh, and judgment is, is awaited on that. As I understand it, uh, Sham and Section 423 were argued, but I don't think, as I, I don't believe that the third way argument was, was deployed in that case. But nonetheless, judgment is expected in, in November and uh, we will see whether that is one of the few places I in which the sham argument succeeds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we now turn to the interesting and important topic of interim remedies against third parties to arbitral proceedings in which Edward Ho is going to speak. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my talk today, as uh, Sir Christopher has just said, is the very pithy title, uh, Interim Remedies Against Third Parties to Arbitral Proceedings. And that title, I hope, tells you what I'm going to talk about, but also explains why my career in advertising, writing catchy slogans, never really took off in quite the way I'd hoped. Um, hopefully, though, if I can't write slogans, oh, or make projector one, there we go. Hopefully what I can do, though, is give you a brief outline of the current uncertainties in this area and suggest some things to think about when you're trying to protect your position in an ongoing arbitration from actions being taken by parties outside of it. Um, the need for interim relief against third parties can be uh, a particular issue in fraud cases. So, for instance, um, it may be that you need a freezing injunction of the kind Paul has just been talking about against a third party to the arbitration. Um, or to give you an extreme example from a case that I had, um, we sought an injunction restraining the ultimate beneficial owners of two um, SPVs that were arbitrating over a dispute that had arisen during the running of their joint venture from attempting to change the directors of some of the joint venture subsidiaries after it had emerged that um, one of those directors of one of the subsidiary companies uh, had been approached by some very large and scary men who clearly just come from a showing of Godfather Part One, um, where, and try to make him an offer that he couldn't refuse, either resign or face a very serious accident. Um, so in those sort of cases, uh, the obvious problem which arises is the um, very scary Russian men aren't generally parties to the arbitration, and therefore the tribunal doesn't have jurisdiction over them. Um, and so what do you do? Until recently, the received wisdom had been to apply to court and to seek relief under Section 44 of the Arbitration Act. Um, and that section sets out the powers which the court can exercise in support of arbitral proceedings. Uh, in essence, Section 44.1 um, provides that the court has, in relation to arbitral proceedings, the same powers to make orders um, as it does in relation to legal proceedings. And Section 44.2 lists the various uh, fields in which the court can um, make orders in support of an arbitration, of which the main one is 44.1e, um, um, the power to grant um, interim injunctions. Uh, so since obviously the court has the power in, in court proceedings to make orders against third parties, um, everyone had 
assumed that Section 44.1 meant that the court also had the same powers in respect of third parties to arbitral proceedings. So the, the power that the court had to grant relief wasn't really thought to be much of a problem. Where the um, wrinkle came was in relation to jurisdiction. Um, as Mark Howard pointed out at the, at the start of this um, conference, um, jurisdictional issues can be critical in fraud cases, and that's particularly true where you're dealing with um, arbitration, because in most international arbitrations in London, it's more likely than not that both of the parties are foreign, and it's therefore unlikely that the court is going to have personal jurisdiction over the people standing behind those companies or any of the other third parties who have been mucking around and interfering in the um, arbitrating parties' relationship because they're all likely to be abroad too, as is whatever business these um, parties are arbitrating about. So where the battleground had been was over jurisdiction, and in particular whether the um, provision that's on the slide, CPR Rule 62.51b, provided a gateway for service out. Now for claimants, it, it looked very attractive, because if you were seeking relief under Section 44 of the Arbitration Act, that provision looked to clearly provide you with a gateway, and so everything looked simple and straightforward. Um, but there was, for reasons that I won't go into now, doubt about whether, in fact, it could be used to serve out against the parties. And uh, over the past five or six years, there have been a number of cases where that has been debated. And it's probably at this point that the real purpose behind me giving this talk is going to become clear. Um, I've only uh, ever appeared in the Court of Appeal without a leader. Um, I'm sure much to the relief of everybody sitting in the Court of Appeal once, uh, and that was in a case called Tedcom and Betabet. And that was the first case to consider this point about whether or not this gateway provision um, could be used to serve out on third parties. And in Tedcom, um, following a remarkable feat of advocacy on my part, um, the Court of Appeal decided that it was arguable that it could. Uh, now, my task was made somewhat easier by the fact that the um, appeal hearing was ex parte, so I was wholly unopposed. Um, but nonetheless, I've spent every opportunity telling everybody about this case. Um, unfortunately, in 2014, there was a decision of Mr Justice Males in a case called Crew City, which we'll see a bit more about, um, in which he said, sadly, I quote, uh, he respect respectfully suggests that TEDCOM is a case which decides nothing more than that there is an argument to be had, that nobody would have ever heard of the case if it were not for the fact that by reason of the internet, everything nowadays is reported, and that it could usefully be forgotten. <laughs> and naturally, I was deeply hurt by these observations. <laughs> but Mr Justice Bell's comments were obiter, so I took solace in the fact that they didn't bind anybody. But unfortunately, um, even that last refuge for my pride is now dead, because uh, earlier this year, uh, Miss Sarah Cockrell QC, as she then was, decided uh, a case called DTEC Trading. Now, it's not really necessary to know the facts of DTEC. Um, suffice to say that an order was sought by DTEC, who was a party to an underlying arbitration, against two third parties, um, directing them to preserve the original copy of a settlement agreement, which was in their possession and which was an issue in the arbitration. In deciding whether under Section 44 to order those third parties to preserve the agreement, the judge not only fully endorsed Mr Justice Mayle's comments about TechCom, um, but more importantly addressed head-on an issue which had been raised in Cruise City. Does the court actually have any power under Section 44 to grant interim relief against third parties? Now, the reason that issue was in play is because if the court can't grant relief under Section 44, then it automatically follows that the CPR gateway that I showed you earlier isn't available. Uh, and as you can see from the slide, the first bullet point, the judge decided that, in fact, there was no power under Section 44. Now, because of time constraints, I'm not going to discuss whether that's right or wrong. Instead, I'm going to try and stick to my talk's pithy title and discuss how, in light of that decision, you can still try and seek interim relief against third parties. Um, because as DTEC itself recognised, um, and that's at the second bullet point on the slide, um, the effect of the DTEC decision is to create something of a hole in the protection that's available against third parties. Um, and the judge herself recognised that that was something of a concern. <clears throat> I think the answer to that, um, at least so far as seeking interim injunctive relief goes, 
is to rely on the court's inherent power to grant injunctive relief in section 37 of the Senior Courts Act. Um, this wasn't discussed in DTAG, um, nor as far as I can tell has it been tested following DTAG, but it seems um, no reason why, there seems no reason why it can't be done, um, especially given the words of Lord Mance in AES. Um, in AES, one of the issues was whether an anti-suit injunction could be granted under Section 44 of the Arbitration Act. And the Supreme Court held that it couldn't, but it could instead be granted under Section 37 of the Senior Courts Act. And it was in that context Lord Mance made the observation um, that's on the slide at paragraph 48 of his judgment, that the, uh, where he said, the better view, in my opinion, is that the reference in Section 442E to the granting of an interim injunction was not intended to exclude the court's general power to act under Section 37 of the 1981 Act in circumstances outside the scope of Section 44. So if DTEC is right, and you can't get interim injunctions against third parties under Section 44, and that's out with the scope of Section 44, then there doesn't seem any reason why you can't apply to court um, and seek relief under Section 37 instead. And that would fill the lacuna that was identified um, by the judge in DTEC. Um, in terms of how the court's going to exercise its discretion, it seems likely that even if you're applying under Section 37, the court is going to have an eye to the requirements, and there are specific requirements for relief uh, in Section 44. Certainly, um, paragraph 60 of Lord Mance's judgment in AES suggests that's the right thing to do, um, and I, I would be surprised if the court didn't look to those factors. But unfortunately, we're not um, quite out of the woods because while the court might have the power still to grant relief against third parties, there's still the question of how it's going to exercise jurisdiction over them. Um, DTEC has ruled out the gateway in CPR Rule 62.51b. There was also another possible gateway in 62.51c, which is that you can seek um, permission to serve out documents where there's a, a remedy affecting an arbitration, but um, Mr Justice Mayles in Cruise City has um, put a nail in that particular arg uh, argument. So the only option really that looks to remain is the necessary, necessary or proper party gateway, which we've heard something about already today. That gateway was suggested in DTEC as a possible route. It was also, I'm very proud to say, the alternative ground on which service out was ordered in TEDCOM. So if only for that reason, you should all read the case and keep it close to you at all times. Um, basically, the idea is you seek relief against the party you're arbitrating against under Section 44, and you establish jurisdiction against them using uh, CPR Rule 62.51b. You've then got an anchor defendant, and you rope in the other parties using the power in Section 37 and by saying they're all necessary or proper parties to your interim relief. Uh, unfortunately, though, that argument, I think, is likely to face serious problems for two reasons. Number one, um, there's likely to be considerable debate about whether a claim for interim relief under Section 44 amounts to a claim for the purposes of um, paragraph 33.13 of Practice Direction 6b. Basically, there are competing lines of authority, um, which were again discussed in Cruise City, about whether or not a claim for interim relief is actually a, a claim. Uh, and Mr. Justice Mayle said it wasn't. So if that is right, then that's the end of using this gateway altogether, in which case I don't really have any positive suggestions about how to exercise jurisdiction, except wait for the people you want to exercise jurisdiction over to come here. Um, the second problem, even if Mr Justice Mayles is wrong, is that sometimes you can have situations where you might not have any basis for actually seeking interim relief against your anchor defendant. So um, I, I don't know what will happen if you have a situation, say, where it's clear that the party that you're arbitrating against is perfectly well behaved and isn't doing anything naughty, but the ultimate beneficial owners who are standing behind it are misbehaving and interfering with the status quo. So there's no real basis for you seeking relief against the party you're arbitrating against, but equally that means you don't have an anchor defendant, so you've got no way for exercising jurisdiction against the ultimate beneficial owners. Um, in short, then, DTEC hasn't ruled out uh, your ability to go to court to seek relief against third parties, but it has made it considerably more difficult from a jurisdictional standpoint. 
and I expect there'll probably be some more cases to come. So if you'd like to instruct me to go to the Court of Appeal on those, that'd be wonderful. Uh, and that's everything for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, what we come to is the trial itself. And Harry Matabu is going to tell us how it should be done. <clears throat> yes. Goodness, it's a very long way from my chair to this lectern, holding glasses, a water glass, a remote with no junior. <laughs> Witness evidence at trial. You've heard a lot of law from my very distinguished colleagues. This is a conference called Commercial Fraud Law and Practice. I'm going to focus on the last of those uh, because uh, law has taken us so far. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, staying until now. I've only got 12 minutes on this subject. I can't cover everything on my handout. In particular, I can't go into the question of the preparation of witness statements. Um, but you may be surprised on that small uh, point by way of a trailer uh, as to the guidance on the contents and language of witness statements, which appears in the Chancery Guide and the Commercial Court Guides and in the cases referred to on that topic in the handout. I commend that to you when you've got a moment this evening. So instead, I shall focus on the question of live witness evidence. Hold on, tuck your elbows in. We're going to take this at a canter. Now, we spend huge amounts of money and slag heaps of our clients' money um, uh, crafting witness statements to stand as evidence in chief following a thorough analysis of the, no doubt, voluminous docu uh, documentation that has been disclosed on both sides. And then we produce supplemental witness statements to rebut the witness statements from the other side. And after that, we're often perhaps increasingly expected to arrange witness trailing for the process of giving evidence at trial, an exercise in the words of one well-known provider of such services by which, quote, witnesses receive a comprehensive understanding of the theory, practice, and procedure of giving evidence, an exercise that has spawned a satellite litigation support industry, bringing revenues and no doubt cheerful pastime to solicitors, barristers, and drama school alumni alike. But now, here we have an opportunity to stand back for a moment and ask the emperor's clothes question. It's a question worth asking because judicial skepticism about uh, witness evidence is long established, and you've heard a little bit about it today already, and it's in rude good health. Judges have for decades known that memories are fallible and inherently unreliable, and that genuine recollection is often, in fact, simply a masquerade of unconscious bias and wishful thinking. See, for example, Lord Pierce in his dissenting judgment in Anassis and Vergotis, where he noted, and this, remember, was in days long before evidence in chief was supplanted by witness statements crafted by lawyers, uh, that a witness's recollection could be materially altered by unconscious bias, wishful thinking, or by overmuch discussion of it with others. Well, he'll probably be turning in his grave as he sees the way we now conduct commercial and fraud litigation in this jurisdiction. Here also, my brothers and sisters, the words of Lord Justice Brown in his judicial reflections in 1982, where he expressed skepticism about the reliability of oral evidence. Observation and memory are fallible. The human capacity for honestly believing something which bears no relation to what really happened is unlimited. And what then of fraud cases in particular? Well, we have already had mentioned this afternoon of the well-known dictum by Lord Justice Robert Goff, as he then was, in the Ocean Frost, where he said that it is essential in cases of fraud always to test the veracity of witnesses by reference to the objective facts, proved independently of their testimony, in particular by reference to the documents and to pay particular regard to their motives and to overall probabilities. So in short, it appears, for at least from those judicial dicta, that witness evidence in itself is unreliable. It is inherently unreliable. And what of the modern age? Well, the tide of judicial skepticism seems to run 
just as strongly nowadays. For example, in 2013, Mr. Justice Leggett warned that the legal system was backward in its continued acceptance of witness evidence as a reliable messenger of truth. And this is a case which uh, Tim Lord has mentioned, the case of Guestman and Credit Suisse, where uh, Mr. Justice Leggett said that whilst everyone knows that memory is fallible, I do not believe that the legal system has sufficiently absorbed the lessons of a century of psychological research into the nature of memory and the unreliability of eyewitness testimony. And so his solution was to view witness evidence with a jaundiced eye. The best approach, according to that judge, was to adopt, uh, in the trial of a commercial case, uh, was to place little, if any, reliance at all on witnesses' recollections of what was said in meetings and conversations, and to base factual findings on inferences drawn from the documentary evidence and known uh, or probable facts. So, presumably, that approach would apply with particular emphasis in fraud cases. And so we ask again, what is the point of witness evidence? Is it all simply a waste of time? Are the courts really concerned only with the documentary evidence? Well, answer, no. Some useful purpose may be served, notwithstanding the caution that judges have expressed in relation to uh, oral evidence. So, for example, one needs oral evidence in order to provide a general narrative to the case. One needs it in order to provide a context for and explanation of the contemporaneous documents. One obviously needs it in order to determine the issues of fact where there are no contemporaneous documents, a dispute over an oral, allegedly oral contract, for example. And one needs it to provide an opportunity for cross-examination, as Mr. Justice Lewison said, as he then was, in Ultra Frame and Fielding, in the light of the disappearance of oral evidence in chief from civil cases, it may be thought that the importance of the witness's own independent recollection in giving his evidence under cross-examination is all the greater. And that, my friend, my friends, leads us to the question of preparing witnesses for the ordeal of giving evidence. How far can we go in such an exercise? Well, there's now, as you all know, an established distinction between, on the one hand, witness familiarization, which is permitted and indeed encouraged, and on the other hand, witness coaching, which we all know is impermissible. And this is, distinction is borne out uh, and expressed in the criminal case of Momadou, in 2005, which, uh, where the distinction was uh, also uh, held to apply in civil cases, again by Mr. Justice Lewis in, in Ultra Frame and Fielding. And in commending the process of uh, witness familiarization, um, Mr. Justice Lewison approved any process which may, and I quote, improve the manner in which the witness gives evidence by, for example, reducing the nervous tension arising from inexperience of the process. So telling the witness to speak up is a good thing, and we may hear uh, judicial insights into what you should say to witnesses by way of witness familiarization. Telling them the uh, course of trial and what to expect is a good thing, but then where does one draw the line between familiarization and coaching? It is not always easy. And in Ultra Frame and Fielding, a um, potential test was uh, referred to, a test from the judgment of Mr. Justice Pitchford in the, uh, Salisbury, a criminal case. Does the witness preparation lend a specious quality to the evidence or give the witness an unfair advantage over other witnesses? Well, I'm not sure that helps a huge amount, but it may take you somewhere along the road. But again, what is the point of engaging in an expensive exercise of witness preparation? For example, is the demeanor of a witness in the box in fact taken seriously by judges as a pointer to the truth? Well, this is a matter which has engaged the minds of judges and behavioral psychologists for uh, many years. The question is, is it worth it? How important is demeanor? On the one hand, you have dicta from, for example, Mr. Justice Lewis in an ultra frame, who, says, who said that he thinks that all that judges mean when they say 
that the demeanor of witnesses has played a part in their assessment of the witnesses is that they've been influenced by nonverbal as well as verbal communication. And Mr. Justice Lewison says, I am sure that I have been. But on the other hand, some of the greatest judges of the last century have doubted the assistance that can be gained from a witness's demeanor. For example, you have Lord Devlin writing uh, extrajudicially in The Judge. He said, the great virtue of the English trial is usually said to be the opportunity it gives to the judge to tell from the demeanor of the witness whether or not he's telling the truth. I think that is overrated. Similarly, Mr. Justice McKenna, writing extrajudicially. Listen to this. I doubt my own ability, he said, and sometimes that of other judges, to discern from a witness's demeanor or the tone of his voice whether he's telling the truth. He speaks hesitantly. Is that the mark of a cautious man whose statements are for that reason to be respected, or is he taking time to fabricate? Is the emphatic witness putting on an act to deceive me, or is he speaking from the fullness of his heart knowing that he is right? Is he likely to be more truthful if he looks me straight in the face than if he casts his eyes on the ground, perhaps from shyness and a natural timidity? For my part, says Mr. Justice McKenna, I rely on these considerations as little as I can help. And then one has once more the trenchant Lord Justice Brown in his judicial reflections saying that uh, he seldom believes that uh, judges can tell whether a witness is telling the truth by looking and uh, listening to them. And finally, the great uh, Lord Bingham, writing uh, his great essay, The Judge as Juror, says that the ability to tell a coherent, plausible, and assured story, embellished with snippets of circumstantial detail and laced with occasional shots of lifelike forgetfulness, is very likely to impress any tribunal of fact. But it is also the hallmark of the confidence trickster down the ages. So, is the analysis of witness credibility and demeanor that trial judges undertake, in truth, simply a fool's errand or even an expensive charade for which the parties to litigation will ultimately be paying? That would be a harsh judgment, uh, and it's not one I imagine that the judiciary would uh, likely accept, because despite the doubts expressed, oral evidence does still count, even in this age of heavily lawyered witness statements and witness preparation. And a case in point on that is Berezhovsky and Abramovich. And I recommend this as reading, again, when you're onto your second gin and tonic this evening. Um, the judgment of Mrs. Justice Gloucester is a useful example uh, of one way in which judges are likely to approach evidence these days, particularly where witness statements stand as evidence in chief and cross-examination is still the centerpiece of trials. And I hope that I'll be forgiven if I just quote to you some of the passages uh, as quickly as I can uh, from that judgment, because it really says uh, pith more pithily than I ever could the point that I wish to make. Mrs. Justice Gloucester, in that case, faced with the um, evidence of Mr. Abramovich and Mr. Berezhovsky on opposing sides, uh, said this, the oral evidence relating to such claims was extremely stale. The court was being asked, in effect, to make findings based on limited direct evidence relating to events which occurred many years ago. Listen to all this, my friends, because we no doubt have many cases which are similar to this, and this is an insight into the way the judiciary might uh, deal with them. She goes on in this way. That problem was compounded in this case by the fact that there had been substantial summary judgment proceedings followed by the appeal to the Court of Appeal during, which course, the, during the course of which round after round of evidence was produced by various witnesses on each side. Given the substantial resources of the parties and the serious allegations of dishonesty, the case was heavily lawyered on both sides. That meant that no evidential stone was left unturned, unaddressed, or unpolished. Those features not surprisingly resulted in shifts or changes in the party's evidence or cases as the lawyers microscopically examined each aspect of the evidence and acquired a greater in-depth understanding of the facts. What was the judicial uh, uh, attitude to that? She said this. It also led to some skepticism 
on the court's part as to whether the lengthy witness statements reflected more the industrious work product of the lawyers than the actual evidence of the witnesses. We've all been there. She continues, however, it wasn't practical given the length and complexity of the issues involved for the court to have required evidence in chief to have been given orally, and it is for that reason, she said, that the cross-examination, in particular of Mr. Berezovsky and Mr. Abramovich, assumed such critical importance. And as a result of that cross-examination, the judge in that case formed, as we all know now, a distinctly poor view of Mr. Berezovsky as a witness, concluding that, quotes, he was not necessarily being deliberately dishonest, but had deluded himself into believing his own version of events, a point which Lord Newberger was making uh, before the break uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, as a general point. She also said that he avoided answering questions by making long and irrelevant speeches or by professing to have forgotten facts, which he'd been happy to record in his pleadings or witnesses, witness statements, that he embroidered and supplemented statements in his witness statements or directly contradicted them and then blamed his lawyers. And finally, that, quote, it was obvious that Mr. Berezovsky approached his evidence as he approached his financial affairs with what Mr. Sumption described as an imperial level of generality. That, again, was a factor which had to be borne in mind when assessing his credibility. So, Berezovsky was clearly a nightmare witness for his own side. And the case also demonstrates the continuing importance of cross-examination in a trial, notwithstanding uh, judicial skepticism about witness testimony. And there one has uh, Mrs. Justice Gloucester's uh, view of the importance of cross-examination as being a very revealing process, particularly when it takes place over a number of days. However well prepared a witness may be, however controlled he may appear to be when giving his answers, it's very rare that the court is not able to reach a conclusion as to whether he's telling the truth or not. And so she endorses absolutely the importance of cross-examination. I'm uh, being given one of Sir Christopher's very familiar um, raised eyebrow looks, which tells me I must keep going, uh, or rather wrap up. <laughs> Let me do so by referring to, again to Mr. Justice Leggett and Guestmin. And when you consider whether or not you should be indulging in a process of witness training and acceding to or advising your clients to spend the money on witness training, finally, let me uh, ask you to read the interesting judgment of Mr. Justice Fleur, as he then was, in Republic of Djibouti and Bore, described as a slanging match between the president of Djibouti and Mr. Bore, where Mr. Justice Fleur uh, criticized the witness, uh, witnesses for the Republic of Djibouti by saying, in particular, that they had, um, it was quite obvious that they had had witness training and had been carefully prepared for giving evidence. And he said that whilst he's not suggesting that that's wrong in itself, it is to be discouraged. And so that's Mr. Justice Flo uh, in 2016. So when you think whether or not it is worth uh, indulging in witness training, bear that in mind, and also the dictum of Mr. Justice Mostyn speaking extrajudicially in the slide uh, that I put on the screen there. Reflect on all that when you next have to prepare for a trial of a multi-billion dollar oligarch case based on an alleged oral agreement reached in a strip joint in Moscow at the end of a vodka-fueled evening in the late 1990s. Thank you very much. Uh, now we come to the part of the uh, seminar when you can learn how to avoid all this sort of thing. Uh, mediators are, we know, experts at d resolving issues uh, and these two mediators, Tony Willis and Stephen Ruttle, have resolved the issue as to which one of them should speak by deciding that they should each speak alternately. I'm very glad you said alternately. It might be instructive if we did it together. You've obviously been having far too much fun with the law earlier today as evidenced by the fact that we're running significantly over time. So Stephen and I will be quite quick. Uh, what I'm going to do is take you more into the world of social sciences rather than the law, and I hope that'll be some relief to you. There are some PowerPoints. Uh, we're not going to refer to them. Uh, I'm not going to flip through them, uh, make such use of them as you wish. There are one or two comments in there, references in relation to 
uh, the Proceeds of Crime Act and without prejudice, privilege and the like. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to deal with that. What we want to do is really uh, blow out of the water two what we would regard as fallacies. One is that mediation is like the judicial process, uh, some rule-driven, settled process. It's not. It can take virtually any form that everyone agrees that it should. And the second fallacy, and I've heard this, for example, first from uh, Mr. Justice uh, Tony Coleman, sadly no longer with us, uh, who told me when I was in a meeting with the Commercial Court Users Committee way back in about 1991, when he said, of course, you can't uh, mediate fraud cases, uh, nor can you mediate multi-party cases. Well, I greatly fear uh, I demurred very slightly at the time, but I now have nearly 20 years of experience of doing both. Uh, so I hope you'll accept that those are two fallacies. What we're aimed to do is try and give you a bit of help in getting the best value out of mediation for your clients, whether you're uh, for the claimant or for the defendant. Um, Stephen, can I turn to you? Do you agree that uh, we see a good deal of uh, fraud allegations in the mediations that we conduct? What's your experience? Without doubt. I think all mediators will say that a significant part of the work they do will involve mediation of claims for fraud, by which I mean claims where someone says they've suffered losses because of someone else's dishonesty. For what it's worth, two of the last five I've mediated over the last two months were, were, were such claims. One settled on the day, one I suspect uh, will settle fairly soon. Um, almost all fraud claims can be mediated. Why? Because all claims that can be settled before judgment can be mediated, and almost all fraud claims, not least for all the reasons that we've heard over the course of the day, the horror and difficulty and cost and time of the process, means that those cases, similarly, can be resolved short of judgment. Uh, can I just apply that for a moment to fraud claims which fit into that category? Uh, I would sort of draw them perhaps into three categories. Uh, what I call category A, which is the misplaced fraud allegation. The claimant is absolutely convinced that the defendant is a villain and the claimant is wrong. Uh, you pour over every document uh, you parse every sentence in a witness statement to seek to establish the viewpoint that the claimant has and holds. Usually, that misplaced belief is because of a breakdown of communication between human beings or organizations or a misunderstanding about what has happened. That's category A. Category B is the uh, uh, correct allegation of fraud where fraud has happened but where the uh, defendant will not own up to it for various reasons, either because the defendant has persuaded himself that he's not guilty or because he's simply not able to hold his hands up to it. Category two. Category three uh, is the situation where there is a genuine, a, 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 an effective allegation of fraud, uh, but where the defendant would welcome an opportunity, if not totally to confess, at least to put it behind him. You've got those three situations. The problem is, for you, when you're representing the client, you don't know which, into which category your case falls. So what do you do? You can wait until judgment when you will know, or you can try something different. So you have a, a, a discussion about do you fight it, or do you settle it? Obviously, it's best to settle it if you can without going to mediation. But frequently in cases like this, the submission to the mediation process and to the involvement of a third-party mediator is really helpful. Uh, so you can settle it if you can. If you can't, do you fight or do you mediate? In my own experience, I know Tony's, and I suspect most uh, or many other mediators I talk to, is that uh, it uh, is abundantly sensible to try and mediate most of these cases. How and when we'll come to in a moment. Uh, not least because in the three illustrations I've given, mediation provides an opportunity for the people who, on that premise, have uh, developed a misunderstanding to meet and potentially clear it up. And that quite frequently happens. I'd like to add also a troubling third, fourth category to your list too. And those are cases which don't happen very often, but they do happen. Uh, I've certainly seen them, and I know other brother mediators have as well, which is a case where 
where the allegation is made with the deliberate intention to destroy the defendant. Uh, and these are cases where, uh, when they come to us, mostly they're cases of a gross power imbalance mm. where the claimant is uh, endlessly funded and the defendants are not. And whatever the truth of the matter is, uh, the defendant is going to get destroyed. And, and one or two cases of that nature uh, I've certainly sent sideways on the basis that the sooner they're in front of a judge, the better. Uh, and it's just not possible to reach a solution in those cases. Conceptually, it should be, but it's actually extremely difficult. Yes, and um, when I said earlier, a case which can settle before judgment can be mediated, period. Mediation is assisted settlement discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, the case that Tony has referred to, the objective is not to settle. The objective is to destroy, and in those circumstances, by definition, it doesn't work. But the, uh, uh, the category of the misplaced fraud allegation, perfectly sensible to mediate, the, category, the third category, where there is a well-made fraud allegation, but the defendant wants the opportunity somehow to make amends or to get out of it or to move on, again, mediation provides a classic opportunity to, prov to, to, to enable that to happen. The harder one, which is the uh, uh, appropriately made allegation of fraud, where the defendant will not own up, I find those harder to settle, yet they frequently will do so, not least because of the defendant's disinclination for his villainy to be disclosed publicly in a judgment. Mediated settlement agreements invariably contain a confidentiality clause which may benefit the defendant. Frequently parties agree to say nothing about the dispute, save where it's necessary for proper business purposes. By the same token, claimants may be benefited because again, usually a term of settlement will involve some guarantee of funds being made available and the agreement is often conditional upon receipt of funds, such that the horror of post-action enforcement uh, is avoided. Stephen, you've, we've heard a lot earlier today about what in fraud cases occurs, which is complexity. Very large amount of time are taken. There's many thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands and millions of documents, the cost of it. There's also a significant risk of obsessive conduct uh, regularly see people who have so completely believed their own assertions uh, that any contrary assertion is very difficult for them to accept. There's a lot of study about uh, the fact that there are uh, uh, people who, uh, everybody, I think, finds it extremely difficult to accept things which go completely contrary to the fibre of their being. Uh, uh, equally, uh, they are very keen on uh, assertions and beliefs which agree with them. Uh, and all of this plays out in fraud litigation. Stephen, how, how does one go about making sense of all of this to the point of getting parties to accept that agreement might be sensible? Give us some clues for preparation. Um, just underlining the point Tony has made, any one of you who's been involved in representing a client in a fraud case will know the massive human, emotional, and financial cost of it. At the end of it, win or lose, you have a client who's gone through a mangle. Um, one of the, in preparing the client, therefore, for a process which may need to address what is frequently, as Tony said, obsessive conduct, what I call the crusade cage, the litigant who is on a crusade to destroy the other, uh, and finds through that process that he or she, as it were, becomes or contracts to the dispute. Your client becomes defined by the dispute. Uh, that sort of obsessive conduct can mean that they find themselves trapped in a cage and they just have to proceed. Um, I would say as an initial stage, we'll talk perhaps in a moment about the timing of mediation, but as an initial stage, Try and get to see the mediator on the basis that you've chosen to mediate two months in advance of the mediation. Uh, I think it's absolutely vital. I think it's imperative in all complicated commercial litigation, all big multi-party stuff, and in difficult fraud uh, uh, disputes that are to be mediated. Arrange a two-hour meeting with the mediator six to eight weeks ahead of time, just the lawyers and the mediator uses the agenda for that meeting a draft mediation agreement. So you, it's like a directions hearing and a mediation. You work through 
who the parties will be, what the disputes are, what the timing of the mediation would be, how long, what documents should be uh, brought to bear, should experts come. And as you work through the shape of the mediation agreement, so you will normally throw out lots of problems that would otherwise arise two days before the mediation. The one thing to avoid is meeting the mediator for the first time on the morning of the mediation. If you can arrange as well for the client to meet the mediator two or three days before the mediation, once again, hugely beneficial. Because what the mediator is likely to do is to be picking up the points that you as the advisor should have been doing, uh, and I'm sure will do, now you've heard what you've got to do, which is to get the client to focus on exactly what the objectives are, what the priorities are, and what he or she really needs to achieve at the mediation. I'd, I'd add to your list of things to talk about well in advance, things like the, what the relationship between the lawyers is. Nearly always it's professional, but occasionally and too often it's not. Uh, I'd also ask about what the lawyers think are the critical barriers to settlement. Sometimes a very interesting answer comes to that question. Um, and it's surprising how often with talking to one side you find their view of bar barriers to settlement uh, are the obverse of what the other side is saying. Uh, they're also uh, uh, then going on into uh, who are going to be the principal decision makers, what their relationship is, a bit about them. It's one of the reasons why Stephen says it's really interesting and important if it can be arranged for the mediator to meet with the principals as well as with the lawyers. It also seemed to me incredibly arrogant for us to breeze into a meeting room with 20 or 30 or 40 people uh, dealing with uh, matters of considerable weight and money, and you've never met the people whose checkbooks are involved. It does seem to me to be quite wrong, so I think that's one a trick which I think you ought to adopt if you can. Pre-meetings, as much reconnaissance as you can about the other side, and then we have to move on to the mediation itself. There is a view from the Americas, I should tell you, particularly from California and Florida, that they don't want to have what I call plenary meetings. This is the initial meeting where one side sets out its stall and the other side sets out its stall and there's a bit of a discussion. Uh, I think I know the reasons for that. Uh, I resist it where possible and I find that people from the west coast uh, of the US, when I'm mediating with them, they lie down under the English uh, uh, attitude to this, which is there is immense value from getting people in the same room and having them talk to each other. It's something that doesn't happen in the litigation process, and it's one of the great power uh, features of mediation. Uh, so don't be deterred by people who say, well, the coming trend is not to have plenary discussions because there's no point. There is absolutely a point in doing that. The, the other thing I want to move pretty swiftly on is the tone of the submissions you make on paper and the tone of the lawyer's pieces. Um, it is staggering sometimes uh, when lawyers are taught a great deal about advocacy. Uh, when it is done extremely well, it is startlingly good. But equally, when it's not done, it is very counterproductive. There have been occasions when, notwithstanding early entreaties to the lawyers to be cautious about what they say and think about what the response they're seeking to get from what they say, <coughs> to find that all they do is insult and offend the principles on the other side. I should tell you that human beings don't react very well to being insulted or offended. The flight uh, or flee principle means that if you do that, all they want to do is think you're a jerk. And I do assure you it does happen. There are very few occasions in which I have seen uh, lawyers come into a mediation and insult and offend the other side because they've genuinely thought it through and they've worked out what it is they seek to produce by that. Uh, but uh, I, I've almost never seen a, a positive result come out of that. And then think about the client's role. I'm very keen to hear from the clients uh, in that session. They'll be advised by their lawyers, of course, about how far they should go. But it is a thousand times more productive for one of the decision makers to say to one of the decision makers on the other side, what their real view about the case is. It can be startlingly uh, effective. We're engaged in a process of persuasion, because the difference between litigation and mediation, of course, is litigation, you're all having a tremendous amount of fun, and I did it for nearly 30 years, having the same sort of fun, uh, to try and persuade a judge of something. The 
process of trying to persuade the business people on the other side to a particular view is completely different. Uh, and uh, you need to recognize that. Stephen, my comment uh, just, about uh, uh, the tone. Yes, tone incredibly important. I often say to my clients that I can count on the fingers of two hands uh, over 18 years mediating when I've seen anybody change their mind significantly in a mediation. If you set against that the hours, days, weeks, months in aggregate seeking to persuade the other side of the error of its ways, waste of time. It's counterproductive exactly as Tony says. You can amass the flagrantly, dishonestly, grossly, all the adverbs that appear in position papers which are wholly counterproductive. One's trying to get the other side to reach an agreement. People reach agreements for all sorts of reasons, some of which are legal merits, most of which are quite different. And quite a lot of which we have no idea and will never know. Precisely. So what one is trying to do is to encourage your client to create the right tone to enable the object that that client needs to achieve. Probably won't get what they want, but usually they can get something that they need. How are you going to deliver that? And that requires work, focus, time. And it's a slightly lateral process for many of us lawyers because we're trying to anticipate how to persuade the other person, not necessarily what the judge's view on a particular legal issue is. Stephen, do you want to wrap up quickly because we're... No, I think I, th I thought I just time. had. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there you are, ladies and gentlemen. It's another world. Now, we're... we're <laughs> It's a beautiful world, obviously, but it's a different world. <laughs> well, there we are. What, you know, <laughs> what do I say? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, <laughs> we, we, Judicial we, put-downs. We've, we've taken more time than expected, and we're not going to postpone the time when, when drinks begin, uh, which is approximately 5.30. But if there are any questions uh, to any of us, uh, now is the time for them. So Christopher, can I start the ball rolling, albeit we've got a short amount of time. As a trial judge, d did you think when you were sitting that witness statements had any real value in a case when there's been lengthy written and oral openings and substantial documentary record? We've heard Harry on the subject. Your view? Um, unfortunately, cases don't quite fall into that sort of categorization. Uh, if, it's, if documents that are the only thing uh, then witness statements, in a sense, ought not to be there at all. Uh, there are very few cases in which it can all be determined on the documents. And sometimes it's not possible to determine whether it could all have been determined on the documents until you've seen what is in the witness statements. Um, it may be that when you see the expensively produced witness statements, uh, you do come to the conclusion that they haven't helped you much. Um, but I don't mind witness statements. Uh, and I think on the whole, there's usually something, even if on occasion it's measured in scintillae, uh, that is of value. My answer. Other questions? David Sandy, Simmons and Simmons. I may be having one of those delusional moments, false memories, but I could have sworn yesterday I um, downloaded the Pugachev Judge Prof Bailey, printed it out, regretted it, because it's long and the printer's right outside my room, and it held that the Pugachev Trusts were indeed shams. Oh, yeah, well, they were then. Um, yeah, so, so it has come out and it surprised me. I think all those assets are now held to be belong to uh, Mr. Pugachev because the trusts were shams. And I just wonder whether that will bleed over into the position taken in respect of companies that now it might be easier to find that companies controlled by frauds are also effectively shams in a similar way. So I don't know how that's going to play out, but um, um, you know, that, w that was to me quite a surprising decision. And um, obviously you haven't seen it, so. Um. But obviously I think the facts of that case are quite extreme, aren't they? Um, and I think the original trustees were replaced by new trustees uh, who, were, um, who, who were really uh, acting at the behest of Mr. Pugachev, weren't they? Isn't yeah, that, I think that's you... the effect of the finding. I, I've only skimmed read it, so I don't know, but I think that, that was what the, the, the judge decided. Well, I'm, I'm glad my talk was cutting edge and uh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing else. In front, In Paul. Front? Paul? Front. 
Hi, Matthew Hennessy Gibbs at Devonshire's um, involved in the Pugachev case. Um, sitting here quietly at the moment. Um, one of the distinguishing factors, and I think um, anyone that's involved in sham trusts, etc., in that area is a riveting read, um, is Pugachev's role within the trust deed itself as a protector. Um, the existence of a protector in itself is not unusual in uh, many jurisdictions. Um, but the um, Burst J found essentially that the role of a protector that he actually had uh, meant that the assets were and remained in his control. Um, and the second limb we also, um, he found on the 423 claim that he had actually uh, dissipated the assets beyond the reach of creditors. Uh, but anyone involved in that area, do read it. Well, that's obviously, we've got to add to Harry's bedtime reading. Yeah, <laughs> with the third gen on top. With the third gen. <laughs> <laughs> Better not be any more. Yep. So. Paul, did you have one at the back? I just have one uh, question from the, from the back. Uh, from a client's perspective, having heard the great and the good uh, delivered today, the client might say, picking up on what Harry Matthew Q said, said, well, why should we go through this enormous expense of witness statements if uh, they don't have any true effect on the court? And is there a procedural way, pragmatically, of avoiding that enormous expense? Is there a way that the uh, um, heavyweight attention to witness statements as a matter of internal commercial court procedure uh, can be avoided? That's what the clients would say. Do you want to answer that? Uh, it's not immediately clear that there's a, a, a magic bullet to deal with that. What I would say about witness statements is that there is guidance in the Chancery Guide and the Commercial Court Guide which tells us that we should not uh, have witness statements which comment on documents, which exhibit documents, which make argument or submissions. And those are, that's guidance which is echoed in the Commercial Court Guide, all of which seems to be more honoured in the breach than in the observance. So it may be that if we all um, obeyed the strictures of the Chancery Guide and the Commercial Court Guide, at least some expense would be saved. Um, I note what Christopher said about the difficulty of knowing whether a witness statement was going to be useful to the court or not until you'd actually read the witness statement and heard the evidence uh, in deciding whether or not simply to rely on documentary uh, uh, record. Another possibility might be, in some cases, I don't know how many, to uh, use the rule in the CPR which says that witness summaries can be used to dispense with witness statements. I myself have had no experience of that, but I don't know if anybody else has. If I just add one point, the American deposition procedure, uh, which is widely abused and costs immense sums and leads to lots of injustice, I've absolutely no doubt at all. But in American practice, uh, and I've tangled for clients with it uh, in the past, is, of course, that you get a very discursive uh, particulars of claim. I sometimes think there's a button on the word processor marked fraud, and it just pumps it out. But the first thing they do is summon all the people on the other side, and they're essentially cross-examined before many documents are done, before the pleadings are, are, are in the end, settled. Uh, and, and, of course, that would avoid the problem of uh, evidence being manufactured, because there's absolutely no doubt that that happens, uh, because the court's going to see the transcript of people being cross-examined right at the outset, and there may be some merit in a modified version of that for the English jurisdiction. Any more for any more? Right. Well, I think it's probably now time for a drink after we have said thanks to our excellent speakers. <laughs> <laughs>